Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Ahmad, for this excellent presentation, very comprehensive and very informative. Uh, we already received a lot of questions. Uh, and if anyone else has any more questions, please submit them through the Q&A button. So uh, uh, we have quite a few questions about treatment, uh, whether it's prophylactic or treatment or the treatment of COVID. So I'll take those first. Um, there are questions about the use of uh, colostrum and also the use of ACE inhibitors as treatment of COVID-19 or as prophylactic treatment of COVID-19. Um, as I said in the beginning, I'm, I'm not in the active phase of treating the patient with COVID-19. Uh, they have been treated by the emergency department and acute care services all over the world. Um, and it is not really a focus of my talk as well. But I'll tell you this, until this stage, we don't have conclusive evidence about any therapeutic option, period. There are some studies that come out that suggest some benefit in some populations, and some harm in some populations or no benefit at all. Even up until today, the, 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 you know, the major publications about, for example, chloroquine use, hydroxychloroquine, in the past we said maybe reducing the kill, reducing the carriage and viral load, publication, publication came that said there's no evidence, it was withdrawn again. So I don't know. That's my simple answer. I cannot tell about the acute care of COVID-19 disease at this time, and I think nobody knows either. What I can say about asthma and about the use of systemic steroids in asthma is that it should be used according to the guidelines as required. So if a patient has an asthma exacerbation and they require systemic steroids, this should be given to the patient. and should not be withheld with the risk of making COVID-19 worse. Steroids have been used as well in the management of acute uh, COVID-19 disease. But the dose and the length of treatment is not really agreed upon yet. If you use it early, you might be of benefit. If you use it in high dose, in the early stage, you might be of higher risk of worsening. If you use it in the later stage, maybe it's required because you suppress the cytokine storm and inflammation. We really don't know at this time, in those critically and sick patients, what is the best option plan. They are using a lot of heparin to prevent coagulation. They are using uh, anti-IL-6 to suppress the cytokine storm. They are using, uh, as you said, ACE receptor inhibitors or suggesting them. Until now, we're not able to tell an answer or tell you what's the best option for acute and critically ill patients. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, we have a very specific question about uh, a study that has been at chromosome 9 at the ABO blood group locus showing patients with blood group A negative. I, I didn't hear the initial part, uh, but no, I'm sorry. Uh, what is your comment on the study that was based on single nucleotide polymorphism analysis at chromosome 9 at the ABO blood group, showing that patients with blood group A negative have increased risk of respiratory failure, while patients with blood group O were at only 35% uh, reduced risk? Uh, I have not encountered the study. So I cannot comment on that study specifically. In the early stages of the Wuhan uh, epidemic, before it was a pandemic, there have been suggestions about the association with blood groups in those specific populations. I've seen one study in that relation, in that specific population. I don't believe it has done, been done in other populations. I'm, I may be wrong, but I haven't seen it. I think it's a very specialized area. Uh, the other question is, does this mutation matter? Is it predictive? Is it prognostic? I don't think you can answer that at this stage. You need a very large population study to do that. That has not been done yet. So my comment is that watch the space. It's not 100% or not clear yet. I can't hear you, Fatma, sorry. <coughs> Uh, 
why allergists prefer the use of biologic treatment. Uh, however, pulmonologists prefer to use steroids. So I guess um, this is a question about when to use biological treatment and when to use steroids in patients with asthma. Okay, uh, so again, this is out of the scope of the talk, but I'll give you a, a brief. Uh, biologics treat special inflammatory mediators. Inflammatory mediators are T IgE disease. An IgE disease is identified, diagnosed, and is a specialty area for the allergist immunologist, not for the pulmonologist because it's an area that we specify in. Uh, the indication for using biologics depends on severity of disease according to the guidelines. Uh, the guidelines suggest using biologics in severe disease where other medication prophylaxis has not been adequately controlling the patient or not able uh, to be taken because of significant side effects. For example, loss of systemic steroids. And there are special categories where we benefit from that. There's a polyps who benefit from that especially, and other patients who benefit especially from that. The current guidelines is that biologics in the COVID-19 disease should continue and be treated as per the guidelines with no restriction because of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, there's a question about um, what about anti-interleukin-1 in STORM compared with anti-interleukin-6? Still, still to be seen, uh, interleukin-6 has been shown to be the more predominant uh, cytokine causing lung damage. Uh, interleukin-1 has been shown to be the most important cytokine in the initial inflammation, an inflammatory cytokine storm. Fever is caused by interleukin-1 predominantly. It's an open space. Clinically, we don't know yet. Uh, I don't know yet at this time. The studies are ongoing. Uh, but they both play an important role in the inflammatory cascade and in the cytokine storm effects. Thank you. Uh, we have an important question that is relevant to the majority of the audience today. Uh, it is uh, directed to, to primary health care doctors. So what precautions should I take as a primary health care physician with regard to examining patients in the clinic with respiratory problems? Right. So I, I did have a lot of some slides about this. I didn't want to make it too much because the, 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 it's difficult. It's not difficult, actually. It's very easy. What are you are doing now? should be done for all your patients. It doesn't matter if they're asthma patients or not asthma patients. Your level of precaution should be extreme in all kinds of patients. And asthma or allergic rhinitis is no exception to that. So distancing of more than two meters if possible, wearing the face mask, the, the wearing the, the mask, the proper mask, the KN95, wearing the Googles at the same time, uh, taking precaution with washing, Wearing the gloves as well. Do not examine the patient unless you have to. Okay, so examine the patient with the otoscope. After seeing every patient, give the time. So after finishing seeing the patient, you need to spend 10 minutes, less or more, sanitizing, changing the, the, the clothing, changing the masking, doing uh, sterilization, changing the bedding, changing everything that's been in contact with the patient. It's a lot of labor work. It's not easy to see patients in the area of COVID-19. So you have to be very careful with distancing, changing, sterilization, using masks, and, uh, and changing between patient and another during the whole procedure again. A bit of immunology. So, uh, how for how long do the immunoglobulins stay in the patient's blood, and for how long can they prevent a secondary infection of COVID-19, uh, and whether COVID-19 can recur again in patients who acquired it a first time? Can I call a friend? Can I? I cannot call a friend, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> okay, so, so this, this is a very, very difficult question to answer. Okay, I'll give you what we know until now, okay? What we know until now is that your lymphocytes are significantly affected by the COVID-19, the SARS-CoV virus, okay? Actually, they are targeted, okay? So your lymphocytes are critical for development of your immune response and control of immune response and developing memory for immune response. And this is for all viruses, never mind the SARS-CoV virus now. So this is a fact that we know. So immunity against viruses is different than immunity against bacteria, for example. The one thing we know, it takes longer time to develop, the immunoglobulins, even when they develop, they're not developed as strong as they develop for bacteria, okay? The second thing is that they do disappear faster compared to bacteria, okay? So can we get, for example, flu again? The answer is yes. Every year we take the flu vaccine because every year we need to boost the immunity for the flu vaccine, for the flu infection. And this is true of all flu infections. You don't develop lifelong immunity for the flu vaccine, unfortunately, because you cannot develop proper memory. But you can develop a protection. How long is the protection? Nobody knows. For especially talking about the SARS-CoV-2, we have no idea. It hasn't been long enough. It's only an infant. It's just starting to walk, but killing many people in the process. It's only six months old. So I cannot tell you what will happen in the future. Nobody can tell you at this time. But there is a high chance it may reoccur. Even when doing the testing, the IgG being present does not always mean a true virus or true previous infection. It could be a false result. We don't have 100% accurate testing, as I mentioned in the earlier slides as well. I think we have to watch this space uh, because we don't know what will happen in the future. In fact, I would suggest we should be ready for the next pandemic rather than be calm and quiet and reassured. Although we should be more ready and we have hope that we have better tools because we already have now better knowledge, better expertise, and many medications under study and the vaccine that's going to be developed soon, hopefully, within the next six months to one year. So we're very optimistic, but we should not think that the viruses will leave us alone. They will not. They will live with us and come back again as they have done in the past. Agreed. So um, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. We do have a question about telemedicine and uh, we have a lecture that is going to talk more in details about telemedicine at the end of this program. Uh, but um, the doctor wants to know your opinion about telemedicine in managing asthma in primary care, uh, whether this is an effective approach in managing uh, asthmatic patients in specific, in your opinion. Okay. Um, I have not open my private practice to see patients with allergy because I believe it is not a good way to practice when you have a necessity for an otoscope or a rhinoscope or when you need an objective assessment of the patient. When you need a consultation regarding uh, uh, talking about risks and risk assessment, that's a very appropriate approach. When you talk about psychiatric consultation, we talk about sometimes dermatology as well, and like seeing eczema, for example, or urticaria, that's actually a very reasonable approach. But when you talk about asthma, the best you can do is get about an opinion about 50%, 60%, 70%, maybe 80%. And um, sometimes we have no option. If you have no option, then you do it, even though it's not 100%, even though it's not 80% in my opinion. Uh, but if you have no choice, then you do it. Because having some support at this difficult time is better than having no support at all. Definitely. Uh, okay, we have um, a question about any new serological tests available yet that are more rapid in detecting COVID? I'm not aware of that. Uh, uh, the current testing, the results could be within about 15 minutes the most rapid testing. Uh, and again, the question here is about sensitivity and specificity. Uh, I do not go into that area of detail. Okay. 
uh, we are still getting a lot of questions about uh, treatment and prophylactic treatment. So uh, I'll take some of those if you'd like to answer them, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, is there a role of zinc for children and vitamin D3 to increase immunity? That's an important question, actually. Uh, I avoided talking about that. Uh, zinc and vitamin D have been shown in some publications uh, to be associated with better responses to the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease or the SARS uh, virus. Uh, in fact, it's been shown that in some of the high morbidity and mortality publications, that those patients, many of them had low vitamin D. And some have even suggested that you should go on supplementation that regular supplementation, 400 international units a day of vitamin D supplementation as a way of reducing the chance of developing severe disease. The answer is, if you want to be cautious, I would say like you do with vitamin C and other things, you can do it. Do I have enough evidence to recommend it as a scientific publication? The answer is no. I will not say don't do it. I may suggest if you want to do it, go ahead. But would I say this to you, would that protect you from disease? I'm not able to ask this question this time. Okay, uh, I'll take one last question. Um, is, uh, is using a mask contraindicated in asthmatic patients? Uh, no, the mask is not contraindicated. It is actually importantly indicated. There are different types of masks. You should know that the need for the mask is to prevent infection from spreading from one patient to another. And that depends on the kind of the mask you use. The only mask that's been shown to reduce the chance of the patient developing the disease is the N95 or KN95. Okay, so the KN95 is the China mask, the N95 is the US mask or European standard, right? They're both equal. The, the N95, uh, KN95 breathability is a bit different than it is with the N95. So the KN95 is slightly more difficult to breathe in. The, these masks are indicated if you are at risk of developing the virus, okay? The other masks, which is the surgical mask, the three-layer surgical mask, and then you have the, 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 the second grade or third grade mask, which is single-layer cloth, okay? They are the poor quality masks. These masks do not prevent you from getting the disease, but may prevent you spreading the disease to other people. Okay, there's a huge difference between the masks. And the breathability of those masks is actually better. But they will not prevent disease from getting to the patient, and they will not maybe reduce the chance of spreading the disease to other people, but not prevent, protect the patient, the asthmatic patient from the virus itself. So the answer is you should wear the masks appropriate to prevent disease, and that's the N95, KN95. It's not contraindicated. In fact, it is indicated for the patient and all the people in general to prevent the spread and the transmission of the virus. Thank you. Uh, we are actually getting uh, quite a few questions, but I promise this is the very last one. Uh, does the immunotherapy affect the immunity and uh, makes the patient more susceptible for cytokine storm? Okay, so, so immunotherapy is for people who don't know what it is. Immunotherapy is a special treatment where the allergist immunologist will give the patient small amounts of the allergen causing the disease in the patient over a long period of time of years, sometimes months to years. And the objective is that you get desensitization. So for example, a patient who's allergic to a cat or pollen receives immunotherapy, given the pollen or the cat allergen, either by injection or by spray, mouth spray, in order to get immunity from the cat allergen or the pollen and prevent the exacerbation of your rhinitis and asthma. This treatment, modulates the immune system in order to, to reduce the effect or the production of IgE and reduce the effect of allergy when the patient is exposed to a particular allergy. This immunotherapy is recommended and is strongly supported by the international guidelines and the current guidelines advise that patients should continue on that treatment when they have a risk of COVID-19 disease, should not stop from taking this, this immunotherapy and continue taking their medication as needed as per the guidelines. 
So it should be used, it should be continued. There's no contraindication to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Ahmed, uh, for the excellent presentation uh, and for the great knowledge that you have provided to us. And uh, I would like to thank the audience for your great questions. I'm sorry because of the, for, the, for the sake of time, we're not able to answer all of them. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your active participation as, uh, as well in the poll questions. Uh, and I would like to again thank Dr. Maytham for his excellent presentation. Uh, we will be taking uh, a break of about one hour now. Uh, I would just like to remind you that we'll continue our symposium at 12.45, so after exactly one hour. Uh, I also want to remind you that you can access the second half of the symposium uh, through the second link that have been sent to you in your registration email, and we'll also be sending you uh, another email.